Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 575 being recorded Thursday, February 20th, 2020. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Sebastian Peak. And uh, we're glad you could join us. We, uh, well, I, again, we, I don't know if we can say normally anymore because we've been off schedule so much recently, but we used to record Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern, and we record these shows live, and you can join us live at pcper.com slash live. Uh, we record, we stream to YouTube. We've been doing that for a while, but now that we've got a new location here and we finally have access to fiber and all that good upload bandwidth, we're also now streaming to Twitch again. So you can join us at twitch.tv slash pcper or uh, pcper.com slash live, which is uh, the YouTube feed. Uh, whichever works for you. Or, of course, you can catch the show on demand, uh, usually the next day. I uh, have those up, and we we do the uh, the sidebar and the show notes and all that stuff uh, in post-production now. Uh, so if you want all that, just wait for that live stream uh, to, or I'm sorry, wait for that on-demand version to, to come up then. But if you want to join us live, if you want to know when we go live for the weeks that we're, we're off schedule, you can head over to pcper.com slash subscribe, where we have our email list, and we use this only to send out an email about an hour or so before we go live or to let you know if there's going to be a delay. Uh, we don't sell it. We don't use it for spam or marketing or anything. We, we just, uh, it's, it's it's not technically a plain text because there's an unsubscribe link in there, but but it's it's a, a plain, you know, it's a basic email that lets you know uh, when we're going to go live, what the topics of the show are going to be. And uh, you can check that out. Uh, of course, uh, you can also uh, join us at uh, patreon.com slash pcper. That's uh, where you can donate to help out the show. Every penny you spend there goes directly to hosting the site and operating the site. So we really appreciate that. And your uh, uh, reward, I guess, if you become a patron, uh, we used to be dur during the live stream, uh, but I guess uh, we can we can just do it for the week now, is that if you... Uh, if you become a new patron or increase your pledge and you'd like to have a shout out, uh, just change the name field before you make your pledge or your change. And I'll get an email and I'll read out whatever you put in that name field uh, or just your name. And uh, we'll, we'll do those live, uh, you know, as we record. And uh, if we have any during the, the previous week, we'll mention those as well. Although I don't think we got any this week, so there's nothing to say for today, but uh, going forward, we'd really appreciate that as well. So check that out. Uh, but let's let's jump into the show. We've got a, a number of topics to talk about this week. Uh, the first, of course, is that we had some new information, some leaks on Intel's evolving 10th gen desktop uh, processors. And this time around, it's the Core F series. The or not the Core F. I'm sorry. The Canon. What is it? Canon Lake. Comet Lake. Gosh, too many uh, too many lakes. Comet Lake uh, F is the one that came out, uh, the, the details leaked on it. Uh, we've got um, information from a uh, Spanish site, I think it was, or Portuguese. Uh, it was some foreign language I couldn't read, but they came out and they had the, uh, the a leaked, an allegedly leaked SKU for the, uh, the F uh, lineup here. That's a 65 watt TDP desktop processors uh, ranging from uh, uh, six cores, 12 threads to 10 core, 20 thread. And in particular, we got some information on uh, the uh, the mid range there, the i7 10700F, which is going to be that that one in the middle in the bottom section there. That's your eight core, sixteen thread processor, sixty five watt TDP. And uh, apparently, there was uh, for that processor there was a leaked Cinebench score. Did you guys get a chance to check out uh, the data on on that leaked score? Uh, just from the show notes, it does not look great. Well, I put it into a um, a chart here so we can kind of compare. Now, this is uh, there, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of outlets that are comparing numbers to existing processors. Uh, so, for your you know for the audience's information here, at the top there that that 10700F that's the leak data, and then the rest of these are based on our own testing, the testing Sebastian did uh, for these processors. So we can kind of compare it here. Uh, the so again, this is the 10700F eight core, sixteen thread, sixty five watt TDP. It, in Cinebench, according to this leak, it got a 492 score single core and a 4781 multi core. And, you know, that puts it behind the 9900K, which is also eight core 16 thread, of course, at a much higher TDP. Uh, and also behind the, uh, you know, the, the equivalent Ryzen, uh, you've got the R7 3700X there, uh, which is beating it both in single and multi. And then 
again, we don't know what pricing is going to be on this, but I threw the R9-3900X on there because that's the, the price competitor to the 9900 series from the ninth gen. And so, of course, obviously with more cores and threads, uh, it's beating it in multi-core. But also, as we know, because of this Zen 2 Ryzen stuff, they do really well in single core. So it's also beating it there on single core. So it's really, you know, the, the score itself is not over, you know, it's not crazy exciting. They didn't obviously make a huge leap because this is still the same basic Skylake architecture, the same iteration. Again, we knew that. Uh, so what it's going to come down to is pricing, I guess. And, and how aggressive do you think Intel's going to be here? Yeah. So, so this, I'm thinking this is the 9700 equivalent in the, in 10th gen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, it, you said it was multi-threaded? Yeah. Th th that's the big uh, thing. Threads. With with this new generation of desktop core processors, Intel had started to pull back. They started for for differentiating their product line. They had gotten rid of multi-threading in in certain product categories. A, the competition from AMD has forced them, thankfully, to go back to that. So we're we're seeing multi-threading almost in, across the entire enthusiast line. Yeah, for for that architecture at sixty five watts, those numbers are actually good. I just and and honestly, that thirty seven hundred X result since it's from us. I don't think I've retested 3700X on the latest Agisa firmware. So that's probably older firmware. So who knows if that would be higher or lower. But it, I just from looking at this chart, and obviously Cinebench is the one where AMD generally wins anyway. So it's not like Intel is going to base their pricing on that. They'll have some other featured group of tasks to show you like why it's faster in Adobe Premiere or something. But I would hope to see it at 299 if this is the performance, but if it is a drop in replacement for the 9700, it's going to be like 369. Although the F's are cheaper. F is no graphics, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So maybe $10 cheaper. Well, I do wonder if, if, I mean, that's how Intel's gone with their F series prior to this. I do wonder if they'll be more aggressive going forward just because of the, the competition. I mean, they're, they're still holding on to the gaming uh, banner, but as we've talked about, they're holding on to the gaming banner in many cases under circumstances that aren't realistic. Like, right. you're not going to buy a $500 processor and game at 1080p. So what's the 4K performance? And when you get to that, or even 1440p performance, and when you get up to those resolutions, that that advantage just disappears, you know, uh, or in, in most cases. So... I just thought of something. Doesn't this allegedly also require a new platform like an LGA 1200 platform. Oh yeah, when you, I was going to say when you mm -hmm. said drop in replacement, these are not drop in replacements. Yeah, I, I meant drop the into the lineup, but yeah, yeah, man, like this this is uh underperforming theoretically based on what we're seeing so far and it requires a new platform. If this was something that existing say somebody who was on Coffee Lake wanted to up, update, they're not going to. So and if you're buying a new system from scratch, motherboard, processor, memory, it's going to be a tough sell unless they still do have that like five, 10% gaming advantage and they can keep showcasing that. Honestly, Intel even currently has a very compelling offering. If you get like a 9400F, that's a great uh, basis for a gaming system. Six cores, it's not hyper threaded, three gigahertz, it's fast enough to get out of the way of a GPU, especially if you're playing above 1080p. So we'll see. Uh, I mean, obviously, again, this is these are leaks. We don't know at what level the, of development the you know was an engineering sample that was early. Um, I mean, we are getting close to launch here, so we'll see. But uh, I'm sure this will be another round where Intel tells us, "Pay no attention to Cinebench. <laughs> there is no no benchmark score behind the Maxon curtain." Any any other thoughts on on this uh, on this lineup? There the, these leaks. What about thermal velocity boost? Uh, well, because we need a new future to keep track of, right? Although to be honest, you know, five point three gigahertz is single core is is kind of spiffy. It you gotta kind of feel really good hitting that, and in theory, hitting uh, what is it? Uh, all across everything, maybe up to four point nine if you've got the cooling. Otherwise, it'll be four point eight, and it's. Not really well explained in a leak because you know that's shocking that we wouldn't get all the in technical information but from the sounds of it if you've got a serious custom water cooler or something that can keep it significantly cooler than what the chip likes it'll give you these solid boosts otherwise if you got a really good cooler it'll probably boost up and down 
that extra 100 megahertz, which is going to give you bragging rights, but not really have a huge effect. I don't yeah. know. 5.3 is is kind of nuts for yep, for single core. I mean, we, you know, it's what the Kentucky Shroud edition was a five gigahertz single core, mm -hmm. sort of no, mostly. That, that was five all core. Yeah. Oh, was it? Yeah, that was the big selling feature. Was that it? Could, it was guaranteed five all core. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Still, that's uh, you know, and when AMD's you know struggling to hit 4.4 .4 on single, and uh, you know. Their all cores four to four two. That's that's a pretty significant jump. I mean, Intel still has some tricks up its sleeve in terms of process technology and overall design that they can achieve those kind of clocks. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see when when it comes out and what kind of price it's looking at and and what other you know performance metrics we would uh, you know obviously see. So they say when the words will be like yeah. No no official launch dates yet, but uh, we're. The, the rumors indicate, you know, first half of this year. So we should be seeing them soon. Uh, and, and if you're interested, uh, WCCF Tech has a, uh, uh, why can't I switch? There we go. They have a nice uh, roundup of all of the, the announced and leaked uh, specs for the, the whole 10th gen desktop uh, lineup. So you can kind of check out, uh, well, you know, what, what we know now kind of laid out uh, in a nice way there. But again, I thought, as that, you... sentence was, I thought that sentence was ending. WCCF Tech has a... Less than stellar track record with rumors. Uh, well, but, okay. Yeah. The, the, I would, I'll put it this way: they put, they publish their bar for what they publish is lower, right? Yes. And they'll publish a lot, one, but the one doesn't source one yes. unverified source. But then they'll they'll have nice they'll do stuff like this where they kind of lay it all out based on all the rumors that have come in. So yeah, it, it's all it's, it's all it's speculation. Too, but. Yeah, it's, it's but we've been hearing this ten series stuff for a while, so it's, it seems yeah. safe. But uh, as as you look through that list, uh, the one the one thing that, like I was saying, the the nice thing you see here is multi-threading everywhere, which we got away from. Uh, you know, at the very low end there, the Celerons. You know, you've got two two, but all the way through the i threes, i four. I'm sorry, i fours, through i threes, i fives, i sevens. Don't give uh, them any ideas, Jim. Yeah, you've you've got uh, 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 multi-threading there, which is good to see that return, and that's what competition gets you. All right, uh, let's uh, check out uh, real quick. We, there was a, a new uh, cooler yet. Sebastian, did you get this uh, from Be Quiet yet? I think if you haven't, they should be sending no, this to you soon. I did not get it. And I now I'm like wondering about like cross messages with emails or something. But yeah, the Shadow Rock 3, which is not an expensive cooler. This is going to be $49 US list. It's yeah, this, an Asus. This is their mid range. Cooler. Yeah, it, this, I mean, it, it's going to compete. It looks very similar to recent designs we've seen from Scythe kind of at this price point. And I think the last cooler I looked at from Scythe, it might have been the Mugen 2 or something. That's around a $50, $60 cooler. This is that single fat tower concept. It's got four direct contact heat pipes. But if you're just listening to this, don't think uh, Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo. This is significantly thicker. It's twice as thick of a heat sink. Uh, let actually, me let me I'm, just I'm correct you real five, quick there. Yeah, five, five. pipes. So, so the the, so, uh, the predecessor to this was four eight millimeter pipes. This has gone to five six millimeter. Okay. So yeah, we'll see how that has an effect on cooling. Uh, their their fans are really quiet on their coolers. So yeah, and this one has that nice top plate. It's the same kind of brushed top plate we've seen from the the black coolers, like the really with an embedded end. screwdriver dark rock <laughs> yeah well this it's nice because they have like access holes on the top so you don't have to remove the top plate you can just stick your screwdriver down in there and tighten it down more easily but yep and it can work with uh an optional second fan if you want and uh it comes with these shadow wings to 120 millimeter pwm fan which as sebastian said be quiet fans are pretty good on noise level yes. so we've really liked their higher end coolers and uh this one at fifty dollars, uh, which is up to one hundred ninety watt TDP cooling capability. So, uh, pretty much anything, uh, you know, without without aggressive overclocks, pretty much anything aside from the Threadrippers, uh, this will work for. So we'll check that out. We'll uh, hopefully have a review here uh, coming up. And uh, yeah, uh, but it goes on sale early March. I think it was March third. And as Sebastian said, fifty bucks. So this is a nice mid range option from Be Quiet, who uh, has really uh, come on strong in the, in those coolers. Uh, 
their, their last few outings have been award-winning from us at the very least. Okay, uh, next up uh, on our news, we've got some information from TSMC. Uh, are they, they're gearing up here, huh, Jeremy? Yeah, it's going to be a busy year for them. It's like, well, not that this year hasn't already been, uh, the 2019 wasn't busy for them. They don't seem to have had any issues uh, with people wanting their chips. But they're looking at a huge uh, amount of money that they're dumping in. Uh, the grand total is $6.74 billion, uh, which is, you know, monstrous. But two and a half of that is going into production of five nanometer chips because they've got some nice customers. The rumor is that all of the Apple A14s will be done at TSMC, Huawei's Kirin 1000. The seven nanometer lines, they also are pulling a bunch of money in because not only are they filled right now with AMD's uh, current 3000 series and all the Navi G GPUs, but uh, whatever the hell you want to call this new Xbox and the PlayStation 5, they're going to be getting chips from there. And of course, Apple went with them for the A13. So they're not going to get uh, the business from Qualcomm, but it looks like they don't really care that much because they've got a huge, uh, huge volume of uh, demand for this year coming up. So we will see uh, just how that goes. And if it means... Yeah, TSMC is... Um, they, they've got a monopoly kind of right now on... Uh, why do I look so red? Anyway, they've got a monopoly on on high performance uh, advanced process nodes. Global Foundries dropped out. Uh, they had a competitive fourteen nanometer that was based on Samsung's. Samsung's a little bit farther behind than TSMC. Um, their stuff is still, you know, it's it's not in as much volume as far as I know. Um, they've, like you said, uh, five nanometer uh, later this year, much later. Their second generation seven nanometer with some EUV uh, on some of the uh, more complex base layers, I guess. Um, yeah, when you put all those things together, I mean, they're kind of putting the heat on Intel in terms of process technology as well. And so everybody's going to them. And if you want a high performance next generation type part, you have really no other choice than, than to go TSMC. They have an excellent engineering force. Uh, they, they've got good tools that you can use to design your products and, and get them to market in a relatively uh, quick manner. Um, yeah, they, they assign engineers to, to your process line to help you optimize that stuff. I mean, it's just, you know, usual stuff that foundries do, but they're really on top of their game. And uh, yeah, it is no wonder that uh, they're, they're going to probably have a, a record year because everybody and the dog is going to be using them because there really is not very much of a choice in, uh, you know, third party pure play foundries. So you got Samsung in Korea and TSMC, uh, global foundries, they're stuck at 14 and 12 nanometer stuff. And, and, um, SMC. Now I think the, did they get bought up by UMC? I can't remember. UMC is still, you know, private, but um, not private, but they haven't been eaten up by anybody else. But I mean, their their process technology is is nowhere near what TSMC is. So I mean, they're they're definitely the the market leader, and uh, that's not going to change because they they kind of struck it rich with their overall seven nanometer strategy. And even though seven nanometers is a bit more of a marketing term. The final products are still very performance capable as well as, you know, competitive die sizes, uh, with the, uh, with the, with the chips that, that they do as compared to the competition from Intel primarily. That make any sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sometimes I feel like I babble. Well, you do, but that doesn't detract from the value. Oh, well, okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so, well, I mean, if it was babbling, it's not babbling. You're verbose, Josh, but in a good way. It's not what my wife says. Oh, <laughs> well, we're here for you. Yeah. Here's your weekly support. She just doesn't group. appreciate the dash V. The dash V? Yeah. Oh, the verbose yeah, mode. Verbose. Oh, gotcha. 
<laughs> well, as long as we don't log it, it'll be fine. Um, yes. All right. Uh, so, so as Josh said, you know, very good uh, position for TSMC. Uh, next they are up on killing it. They are yes, they are absolutely just killing it. Yeah. I believe that was the summary of what Josh just told us. Yeah, that's my like low intelligence view. Nice. Um, next up, we've got uh, uh, some news uh, because it sounds like this would be a great time for a big security vulnerability for medical equipment, huh? Uh, there's no, there's no major global <laughs> medical crisis happening right now. Let's let's infect all the med- medical equipment. Tell tell us uh, what is going on with Blue Keep, Jeremy. Well, I mean, this is just the latest and perhaps the scariest. Uh, See. So you- it, you're lucky if your hospital is running Win 7, to be honest. Uh, it's probably running older operating systems than that because those systems have been proven to work. And when you're an anesthesiologist or, you know, you're doing powered surgery that requires additional electronic tools to do it, you do not want them to crash. That, that You don't have time to reboot the damn thing. So patching and upgrading systems is very, very slow in hospitals. And I don't disagree with that in, in theory, but the problem is that it just keeps stacking up. So some re- a research company called cyber MDX, uh, is one of the few that are out there sort of checking for the blue keep vulnerability, uh, that's, you know, spread all over the place. And they've determined that 44% of every single bit of uh, connected medical equipment they could connect to is vulnerable. This one is a pretty nasty one that, you know, all of a sudden you'll start hearing about hospitals being held hostage by ransomware far more so than you already do because it's already started to happen. And this sort of pushes it to the, okay, we understand you have to have absolute stability but now the chances of uh, a kernel panic or something going horribly wrong with a Windows 10 or a Linux-based system is far less than the chance of somebody coming in and just taking that machine over or using some of the other very interesting ones out there to, you know, change the, the voltage being provided to an X-ray machine uh, or do some sort of very interesting things to diabetics or people with heart monitors so it, it, we're hitting the point where a lot of hospitals that are sort of currently strapped for cash are also going to have to find a way to upgrade some of their systems because when the point where almost half of the stuff you've got is vulnerable, y- you've got a problem. Uh, yeah, uh, we need to apply the Battlestar Galactica uh, approach here. No, no network computers, hard, you know, mechanical separate firewalls man and back to the iron lung i mean i used to work in healthcare technology i worked for mckesson doing uh their patient record software i don't they've merged and split and i don't know if they're still using it but it was horizon patient or horizon patient manager i think that's what it was it was, it was a big like multi-billion dollar software package they'd sell to hospitals and we'd go around and install it for them and uh, I was at this one hospital in upper uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan, uh, up near. So, although you know, I, I learned that the 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 UP don't really consider they, they don't have much kinship with the the lower no. state. No, they are no. very very different. Uh, but basically, Canada. I mean, honestly, yeah, it's Canada. They speak with a Canadian accent. It's it's alarming. Hmm. Uh, they're very interesting. But uh, up in the UP, eh? and uh, there was a hospital up there. Wonderful people and everything. But we kept having these issues. Um, where we were getting unexpected network traffic and uh, local on the, on the, on the LAN. And uh, we were trying to trace it down and we, we went and we found a print server. Um, <laughs> or I think it was, that's right. It was a print server running windows 98 in a closet. Now this was in 2007. So, but still it was running windows 98 in a closet, not even SE like OEM first release of windows 98. Wow. And uh, yeah, we had to stop that. I think I gave them, I th- uh, what's the statute of limitations of this? I think I gave them a pirated Windows XP key just to get them off Windows 98 on that because they didn't <laughs> they didn't have any more enterprise seats and they uh, they needed to get upgraded. So I think I activated it for them. But you were saving lives. Yeah, at the time, 
now they're going to they trace probably haven't updated it yeah, since you were right. there now somebody's going to trace that it, it it killed somebody and now they're going to find me hey jim um, good thing you didn't give out your public ip at any point tonight yeah yeah sure all right uh well so yeah just uh Maybe as a patient, you should ask the hospital before they conduct any work on you what their IT security status is. Maybe yeah, they could use no some, idea. you to bring in some spare parts with you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bring in a my, few Windows licenses. Yeah. My wife works at a hospital, and she's constantly calling me after she calls the IT department. Nothing against first-level IT. I encounter so many issues that when she has one, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this, almost immediately. So today the call was or the text was, I'm on the phone with IT. My outlook is really fuzzy and I don't know why. IT has no idea what this is or how to fix it. So I wait. Yeah, they still have no idea. Okay. They don't know about display scaling. They recently nope. updated their hospital is actually on Windows 10, which is frightening. But it's like, well, it's display scaling. I bet you change resolutions and your Citrix instance is still stuck at whatever resolution. It looks really fuzzy yep. until you log out, log back in, blah, blah, blah. They didn't know any of this. And she's yeah. like, well, yeah, I mean, I docked my laptop and it's plugged into my monitor on my desk now. Like, there you go. But it took me telling her, log off, log back in. Isn't that the the most basic level one tech thing? No. Did you reboot? Did you turn it off and turn it back on? Have you, you tried turning it, it, it off and on again? I happen I to know some that when they the first connect remotely and the remote viewing software is only showing a small portion of the screen because they've, and that's the end of the support call right there. <laughs> oh, there's something wrong with your machine. We can't access it. Yep. And I mean, yeah, what so, do they call it? it's a, uh, it's a picnic. Isn't that the uh, problem in Pep chair, CAC. not in computer? Pepcac. Um, Pepcac. Problem, problem exists between chair and keyboard. Yeah. Yes. Of course, there's also the, nice. uh, yeah. the 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 uh, venerable ID ten T error, or one of my favorites since we've been talking about uh, the medical profession is pumpkin positive. Pumpkin positive. What's that mean? If you uh, took a light and shone it in one ear. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, that is something that will appear on medical sheets if you are that type of person. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. All right, well, let's uh, let's wrap up uh, or almost wrap up the news here. We've got some uh, something I was kind of excited about that Jeremy found for us. Uh, could we could we see uh, at least in spirit Bioware rise again, Jeremy? It, it sounds like it because you've got three of them now. You've got James Olin, uh, who worked on almost all their majorly successful projects. Chad Robertson, who was the Austin studio director, and joining them just recently was Drew Carpician. All of them from Bioware. Uh, Drew and uh, James, you'll know from like Dragon Age Origins, uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Neverwinter Nights, Baldur's Gate, uh, all of the good stuff. Uh, Drew did the Mass Effect 1 and 2. He did not do 3, so if... You liked the first two and you hated the third one. It wasn't him. So Archetype is working on a sci-fi RPG of something, but they're hiring up a bunch of the old Bioware people with the idea of rebuilding something resembling the original years of Bioware, where, you know, making the game the way that developers saw it was more important than making it match the most uh, popular of the market research results. So we shall see just how this goes over the coming year, years. I'm sure it'll take a little while to put out. And in the meantime, it, it could be a lot of fun to see if uh, Anathem is going to be at least a reminder, a, a pale shadow of what we grew up with. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited because I've, I mean, for me, the last, like, I, I knew that Mass Effect 3 had a bit of controversy, uh, but it was still enjoyable because I was still, you know, I only ever played the second one. I was I was still high on the first two. You should play the first at the very least if you've played the second because it's uh, the, the story is great. I, I, Mass Effect's one of my favorite series of all time. But then Andromeda came out several years later. I think it was 2016, 2017. And that was a disaster uh, through and through. And they tried to fix it. Fallout 76 they, proportions? 
Um, well, so that, I mean, that, 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 that brings in, you know, the <laughs> online service aspect, which is even, you know, more of a, a problem, but the game, it just, it broke my heart. Uh, Andromeda broke my heart. And so to get back, well, go ahead. Well, so to, to get back to that, uh, level of, of, of production and storytelling, if these guys can pull it off, I will, I will pay any amount of money to get a game like that, but don't tell did, them did, that. did you guys see that, uh. They they're 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 gonna try to do to Anthem what what they did to No Man's Sky. Oh, just keep I mean, No, no, keep no Man's Sky has, yeah. now, has now finally become a very good game. And yeah, but yeah, it it took a long time, and, and I think that that is interesting in that you know the community really has kind of rallied around No Man's Sky. Um, you know, after being after after hammering it, because we've all seen the you know, what was promised and you have the Jurassic Park <laughs> theme and then what was delivered and some guy playing the Jurassic Park theme on a, on a kazoo. Um, <clears throat> after getting hammered, you know, mercilessly, uh, they, they, they got it all together and, uh, you know, delivered a, a good, good product. And, and I think that, you know, the response that the community has had and then the further success that, that they've done just by addressing these problems head on is like, you know, maybe, maybe Anthem will eventually become a good game. I know this I went on to a giant no segment. Man's Sky added cockpits with uh, throbbing veins, is it? What? Is that the new update? Is like newest bio ships? Cockpits with bio ships with throbbing veins. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, no, I don't want to go there. Okay, that wasn't what caught you. No, nope. But I mean, it, I mean, the, the the continued development of No Man's Sky is is incredible for for a game that doesn't have like a, a service online component where they're not getting the revenue. I mean, uh, you know, to be fair, they they've never really gone on sale. I mean, the price has come down and there's been like half off sales, but it's still twenty five thirty dollars. It's never gone to one of those bargain bin Steam sales where it's five bucks. So they've kept the value of the game high that way. And I guess the, sur you know, cause so many people, including myself, were very excited about it. And I bought it at launch and it was very underwhelming at launch and, and did break the promises. But I, I don't think I've seen a game, a single player. I mean, there's multiplayer in it now, but a non-service game like this have this much support after so many years to keep getting major yeah. updates. Uh, so... I have to buy it just to like except for maybe what arcs ARX or a which one is that kind of Minecraft except with dinosaurs? Oh, oh Ark uh, Survival Ark Evolved. Survival yeah. Evolved. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that was wasn't that an early access forever kind of game? Yep, where it was it was always, or it, I don't know if it still is, but it was very long in development. Uh, whereas this was a you know Sony backed major release, uh. But uh, yeah, well, keep an eye on those. And uh, as we said, you know, check out, there is a new, I think it was just announced a couple of days ago, a new uh, No Man's Sky update um, with uh, the, the key feature, I guess, is, is a bio, bio ships, living, living ships, throbbing control panels. But uh, a little bit of sad news to wrap up our, our news this week. Uh, Larry Tesler. He is, uh, I guess, best known as the inventor of copy and paste while he was at Xerox, but he also was very influential through the, the development of, of, of uh, a lot of things we know. He was at Apple during the Lisa days. He stayed on all the way through the, uh, the next acquisition when Steve Jobs came back. In fact, from what I've read, he was instrumental in, in getting Apple to, when they were deciding how they were going to go, he was the one, I think, who, who convinced, uh, was it Gil Emilio who was in charge back then at Apple? But he convinced so, yeah. Apple little leadership to go with Next, and uh, uh, he, he's, he would then went on to work. I think he was at Yahoo and at Amazon, and um, and just uh, 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 one of the big players in development in the development of, of personal computing. And uh, he passed away on Monday at the age of seventy four. Uh, there's a nice write up over at um, uh, if I can switch there we go uh, over at Computer World. There's a nice write up that uh, kind of. Is a summary of of his time. Uh, you know, he was the, he was he was the one. If if you remember when Apple went to Xerox in the eighties and uh, copied their all their technology, the GUI and the mouse and and everything, he was the the Xerox employee who gave the Apple team the tour 
Uh, he was there, and then he came over to Apple after that, worked on the Lisa, worked on the Mac. Um, and uh, and the, the article here, we'll have a link to it in the show notes, goes through. It's got some video clips with him, uh, and uh, kind of it's a nice summary of, of just a, a, a small sample of the contributions he made uh, to the industry. So uh, uh, Larry Tesler, uh, you know, has left us at the age of 74, so... Our condolences to his family, and uh, let's all take a moment to, rem- you know, as, as these guys, these pioneers who really shaped the industry, if, you know, they're getting old and they're passing away, we should try to at least remember them a little bit, because everything we do oh, yeah. is is built on on the shoulder of, of, of people like this, so. So he, he basically hit control X. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and actually, there were, uh, Brett, our, our uh, web developer and uh, web hosting provider, he Gave so he posted something in our Discord that I thought was funny on the PC Gamer uh, news uh, story about his death. Uh, it says Larry Tesler, inventor of the cut, copy, paste commands, dies at seventy four, and a whole in in in, in uh, honor of him, a whole list of people cut, copying, and pasting the that statement down down the list there. So, so that was fun. A fascinating book for anybody interested in in his career and others at park and the development of all this stuff is called dealers of lightning. I, I don't know if it's in print anymore. It is on audible. Last time I checked, I have it in my library anyway, but it's a fascinating tale and you'll learn all about the stuff, the development of the graphical user interface, the mouse, Steve jobs coming in in like 78 or 79, whatever it was and getting the tour and Steve freaking out like, you have to do something with this. This is a, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And then going back to his team and saying, we have to copy all of this. Yeah. So I think he, what he, he, he turned to them and he yelled, you know, you idiots, you're sitting on a gold mine. Yeah. And, uh, and then of course, uh, again, as I, not having personal experience, but through the books and, and articles I've read, apparently his own team, Raskin and those guys were working on similar concepts. So Steve came to them and said, you know, what's it going to take to copy this? How long? And you were like, eh, a few months, I think I said six months. Yeah. It was like, oh, all right, <laughs> so not too bad, uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll put. It, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, Sebastian, if you could send me that uh, note on that book, I'll make sure we have a show yeah. note uh, link to that as well, if we can find it in print or at the very least at Audible. Uh, all right, well, just uh, we're going to take a break before we jump into the reviews, and we're going to thank our sponsor for this week. We'll be right back. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Now there are a ton of VPN providers out there, and you've probably heard of a couple of them. Uh, Some of you may have even used one. At least I I hope you've considered using a VPN because VPNs, at least a good quality VPN, is essential for protecting your your privacy and your security while you're browsing online. But, you know, I like to have sponsors that I can personally recommend because of my own personal experience. And one of those in this case is ExpressVPN. That's why I was so excited to have them become a sponsor. It's because I've been an ExpressVPN customer since March 2017. It's been about three years. At that time, I looked at a bunch of services, uh, both both paid and free, and ExpressVPN uh, not only was the fastest, but as, as I'll mention here, they're the one that I trust the most in terms of how they handle uh, user privacy and user security. So from my own perspective, over these last three years, ExpressVPN has been the best VPN, and it's the one that I recommend to friends and family. And, and here's why. First, ExpressVPN doesn't log your data. Lots of uh, VPN services, especially the ones that are very, very cheap or free, you know, they have to make money somehow. It's very expensive to run a VPN network. And so if, if you're not paying for your VPN service, they're making money somewhere. And that could be, you know, selling your data to ad companies or, or you know, logging and tracking for other type of marketing purposes. And you don't have that with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN developed a technology called Trusted Server that makes it impossible for their servers to log any of your info. And that's because they they store your, your session data in volatile memory, in RAM. And so once your session is over, that data is erased. It's, it's not erased in the sense of a traditional hard drive where you can recover it. Because if you, if you understand volatile versus persistent storage, with volatile storage, when the power is cut, when that session ends, that data is gone. And so you're protected, your session is private, ExpressVPN, even if they wanted to, couldn't market your data. And of course they don't want to because they value your privacy and security above all else. The second reason is speed. Now, when you use a VPN service, all of your traffic is routed through that VPN's servers. That's that's how it works. That's the, the magic of a VPN. That's what protects and anonymizes your data. It's what 
allows you to appear like you're you're coming from a different location in order to access uh, region locked content. So if your your VPN server is slow, that that'll be your bottleneck. It wouldn't matter if you had you know gigabit fiber at the house. If your VPN server is running at dial up speed, that's the experience you're going to have when you're connected. And I've been using ExpressVPN, like I said, for three years. And this is one of the reasons I chose them, one of the primary reasons I chose them. They were the fastest among all the services that I personally use. So when I'm you know, browsing at other websites, uh, I don't feel any slowdown. When I'm accessing video, if I'm trying to access BBC video from the UK, which is reg region locked there, I can stream in HD. You, you, know, you still need a, a fast internet connection at home at your source, but the point is ExpressVPN is not going to be your bottleneck. So whether you're, you know, you're on DSL or if you've got a nice cable modem or you're, you're at fiber speeds, ExpressVPN is going to keep up no matter what. And the last thing that really sets ExpressVPN apart from the other VPNs that, that I've personally used and that I, I tried out was just how easy it is to use. Unlike some other VPNs, you don't need to input or program anything. I mean, you can if you want to. They, they give you that information. If you want to manually put in DNS and all that and, and, and set things up, you have that option. But if you don't want to deal with that, you don't have to. ExpressVPN has great user interfaces, great apps that allow you to have quick and easy one button setup and connect. And it works on all of your devices, PC, Mac, iPhone, Android tablets, uh, even through your router with your smart devices at home, Apple TVs, Roku's and everything. It's very easy to set up, very easy to use. So it's something that you don't need to worry about if you're, you know, if you're setting this up for grandparents, uh, parents, spouses, friends, you know, less technically savvy people in your life, you don't need to worry about it. You can show them how to connect with a single click and they'll be up and running. You'll know they're secure and they're going to have a great experience because of because of that speed because of that performance and that flexibility on all of those servers. And it's it's not just me saying this. Like I said, it's, it's been three years. I, I've been a paying ExpressVPN customer for far longer than they've been an advertiser. But check out other outlets, places like TechRadar, The Verge, CNET, and many others. They rate ExpressVPN number one in the world. So protect yourself with a VPN that I use and trust and support us here at PC Per. Just head to ExpressVPN dot com slash PC per today, and you can get an extra three months for free on a one year package. That's expressvpn.com slash PC per check it out to learn more about this deal. And again, get those three months free on a one year deal. Thanks so much to ExpressVPN for supporting the PC perspective podcast. And we're back. So let's jump into the reviews this week. We've got uh, two reviews uh, up uh, on the schedule here. The first is a review from Chris Koch. He's back with a review of a, uh, a pretty pricey, yet justifiably pricey, mechanical keyboard from Drop. Um, now, Sebastian, can you, I, I believe you worked with Chris to get this yeah. in the system. Can you, uh, can you kind of walk us through what he thought about this? Yeah, well, first of all, Drop, uh, a.k.a. Mass Drop, their former moniker. They have a number of, of these things and keycaps and other things for the keyboard enthusiasts, but this was this is based on a previous keyboard. There was a drop alt keyboard before this. The high profile version that Chris reviewed includes this massive aluminum shell that comes up pretty high, kind of like a, a traditional keyboard where you're not showing more than half of the uh, keycap and you're not exposing the bottom of the keycap like so many where you actually have like the stem of the key switch visible so this right off the bat it's more traditional until you uh, you know look at it and realize this is a 65 percent keyboard so if you're not familiar with the the smaller form factor keyboards this one is basically a 60 percent keyboard but with an extra row of five keys on the far right just to give you a little bit more functionality the layout's slightly different from a 60. You have no function keys up above the number keys. It's kind of like an old typewriter. Like if you think about the layout of keys on a typewriter, you have your QWERTY keyboard, you've got a few other options and that's it. So it's great for just sitting down and focusing on writing or something. But one of the things that Drop does with this is layers. They program in layers uh, so you can have a modifier key and then present yourself with a completely different set of keys 
Uh, I don't know. I'm sure memorization is required because these keys are obviously not going to change labels, but it's interesting. Oh, and, and this, yeah, it's $230, but this is basically a pre-built project keyboard with high-end components. And yeah, if you're watching the video, you can see this QMK firmware thing. You pick out what layers you want, you compile it, you save it. It He said it takes just like 30 seconds or something. It doesn't take that long to program it, and then you're good to go. Uh, colors are also covered th through this. Like It is fully programmable per key, backlit, but very, very simplified from a hardware standpoint. And you might ask, why on earth is it this much money? If it's using like standard key switches, the PPT keycaps are nice, but you know what you're paying for essentially is a build that includes hot swappable uh, key switches. You can literally just pull out a keycap, pull out the switch, pop in another switch on the fly. So it's it's modular. And the keycaps are really nice. I think we've talked, I've talked at length about PBT keycaps and they're amazing. If you haven't used a keyboard with them, Chris talks very uh, extensively about the feel of this. He, he has a very good explanation of why a PBT keycap, why a keycap in general affects the feel of things. And it's not just that, it's, it's other stuff that goes into it, but it's really not just, oh, I prefer this key switch because you can use a keyboard with a specific key switch and love it and try another one and it doesn't feel right. And it's all about the keycaps and the, the overall build, the depth, the air, you know, it, it's kind of amazing how much the keycaps affect things. And he went all out with this review because obviously they sent this for review. Chris went out and bought this uh, expensive set of alternate keycaps and then customized it. And it's this retro looking, they don't, like the light doesn't pass through the keys. It, it it looks like it's been transformed to like a 1970s terminal computer keyboard or something. It looks fantastic. We're talking like the darker shaded tab and shift keys. And it has an orange return key and an orange escape key and off white for everything else. It looks phenomenal. You paid $90. It, it looks like the, the old IBM Selectric. Yeah, uh, yep. it's, it's it gorgeous. Does. So Perfect he was one. just totally nerding out about this review, and he's a big keyboard enthusiast. So he he thought the price was justifiable, but it is extremely expensive. It's two hundred and thirty dollars. But he also said you could beat someone, hammer in some nails, and then go and use your keyboard. It's it's, I think it's almost three pounds, and it's very small. So it you don't really realize how heavy it is until you're holding it. It's extremely small and dense aluminum keyboard. That's a very, very high quality build akin to a, a custom product. So for that audience, this might this might be worth it. But I was just looking at this and thinking, I kind of want a 65% keyboard now myself. Just for writing. I'll I'll I, expense it, Jim. Don't worry. <laughs> I could never use I, I, I use the number pad uh, yeah, too frequently way too much. To, to justify it. But this is uh a nice, apparently a very nice keyboard. And, and yeah, Sebastian said, uh, Chris is a keyboard fanatic. So uh, his his word and his evaluation carries some weight uh, in these matters. So so check it out. I was going to launch the uh, drop uh, purchase page here, but I, I'm not oh, logged course. in on Firefox. Right. So I, uh, Drop is a frustrating website to interact with. Because unless you have a login, in which case you don't even notice. But if you don't, it's like splash screen, splash screen, back, forward. I, I sometimes I'll hit like next, close it. Oh, I have this page now. I actually had the page for this keyboard up and then I never got it back again. And I refuse to log in on principle. Yeah. Plus it's well, just unhealthy. Like you can if, get lost. Don't you have to have like your elbows in your stomach though to type correctly kind of. on that thing? You got you got your 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 hands real close together like like this, like you're a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I, I mean, I, I'm okay with my elbows being more bowed when I type. Hmm. I mean, Josh, I Josh, obviously using proper form here. Like if Josh were to shoot a basketball, are your elbows like you have that nice line all the way down and perfect form with the jumper? I never had oh. that. I'm 
elbow yeah, flying sure. everywhere. Yes, me. Okay. Like that. Exactly. Just say yes. Well, if you can Josh, type you on look a, like a guy who'd be a, a, a outside threat. I can see Josh just like camping out in the corner. And well, I knew Kenny Sailors, people. so I have that going for me. Nice. Uh, the the inventor of the of the jump shot. Oh, so. Well, but Josh so co developed co developer of the jump shot. No, yes. no, no. He, no he developed deal. that in like 1939. So. Oh. Okay. Well, how, how'd yeah, you meet him? No. Uh, he was the great uncle of some friends of ours, and he came and moved down here with them. Um, he was on the UW uh, Wyoming basketball team that won a national championship in like 1943, and he was credited with the uh, the invention of the modern jump shot. Wow, very cool. Yeah, he re- I mean, yeah. is he is he still with us? No, he died about four years ago. But he so, they he entered in, he's inducted in the the basketball hall of fame. I'm just oh, saying, then, who's going to call you out if you put that on your resume that you assisted in the I further not, refi- no. in the refinement of the jump shot? You know, nobody his, can his, do math anymore, Josh. So they'll his, believe it. His niece-in-law would would come and slap me. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So I can't do that. What are the chances she's going to do that anyway? Pretty high. Okay. All right. Well, uh, not to take too much away from the drop uh, alt high profile mechanical keyboard but uh, check that out we have the uh, the full review there with uh, chris's impressions and photography and uh, you can check it out we've got a link to that store page just make sure you're logged in to your drop account uh over there all right uh, wrapping up the reviews this week we've got uh i saw the uh, the press release on this come out and i was kind of interested i said i wonder because obviously we don't communicate very well here at pc per now that we're all remote i was like i wonder if sebastian has this case and he sure he does it's the new fractal Define define seven, XL. So uh, tell us what's your first impressions of this new case from Fractal. Well, my first first impression was holy crap, this box is huge. It was left on my front step. I dragged it into the house. Pictures don't really do it justice. I would have to put something up against it, but it is giant. This is a full tower case. The previous versions of the Define R series, which I I reviewed, I think the R5 and the R6. I was not the one who did the R4. Does, does it does it does it have five and a quarter inch bay? You know what, Josh? I'm glad you asked that question. And if you scroll down just a bit, Jim, if you're watching the video, you can see the front panel open and look. There are not one but two openings for five and a quarter inch external drives. Ooh. And that's nice because the previous version, the R6, only had one. There's a metal bracket there you remove, but yes, it does support two optical drives. And the R the R five had two, the R six dropped it down to one, and with seven it's back up to two. And I need to check. I don't know if it's just the XL that has two. It might be because there are two versions this time. There's the regular and the XL, and this is the full tower XL version. So nine expansion slots in addition to three vertical expansion slots if you want to use the uh, optional hardware and mount your GPU vertically because you love high thermals. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, but this is a giant, I said this like eight times already, giant case, very, very open internal layout. The previous Define R6 came with all of the hard drive trays pre-installed behind kind of a shroud. So it took up a good third almost of the inside of the component chamber. This does not have that. You can set it up for storage. It's called storage mode, I believe. And it comes with a few of the brackets to get you started. They actually sent some extra ones along to do a complete storage heavy build. So I'll have to do that next. Uh, but just for first impressions, I took it out of the box. I checked it out inside and out. I did a full build inside of it just to kind of see how the build process went. And I, you, you just, I don't think you realize how much extra space you have until you put an EATX board in here. And there's still just tons of room around all sides of the motherboard. I, I put, I use so many mid tower cases and review so many that I'm just not used to having like an inch or two of space below the motherboard, two or three inches of space above the motherboard. It was hey, zero. If, if issue. I can just interrupt yeah. real quick, yeah. hey, can you scroll up, Jim? Yeah, I, you know, the red border on that SSD makes it pop, and you understand exactly what is sitting there. That is, that's so subtle, mm-hmm. yet so, so, so informative. I'd just like to compliment you on 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 your your eye for color you know Josh, i'm glad you i'm i'm 
glad you pointed this out and we won't go too far into this Jim, but you know, you know, when I set out to take case photos, I think about things like this, like the SSD has a black label, but it's red. And also the red really helps me key into the mood and red is an aggressive color, but at and the I'm same angry time, at storage. Angry. Yeah. It's, it's a very understated look. And there's never you, enough of it. When you're looking at a black case with a black motherboard and black cables with black Velcro straps, then that red SSD really stands out. It says, hey, I'm here. I'm powerful. Uh, I'm 480 gigabytes of SATA SSD goodness. I mean, we've been using that Corsair SSD for a while in our test yeah. builds. And when it dies, we're going to have to just either in post or just get some red tape because... Just also use it as a dummy. You know what? Just, just rip the for case photos. open. Yeah. Rip the case yeah, open even, and put in new hardware. Good point. That's yes. good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Why don't more people do that? Why don't people buy an SSD that that has the aesthetic they're looking for, and then put the innards of another one inside it? That's the you new brand SSD dollar dollar cases idea. coming up. You can mm-hmm. do that. Yeah. RGB. Customize. I need to add RGB so I could choose whatever color I wanted. This is genius, Josh. Yeah. Oh, they, RGB. Yeah. SATA They've already SSD. got those. They've got shell. RGB SSDs. But I need yeah. the shell. But now you just the buy shell. the shells. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And the, the memory chips in there only take up like 10% of the volume. So you could just load that thing up. See, now right. Kent is asking for it. No, see, we're gone, we've gone too far. We've gone too far. <laughs> uh, it's, what was I even saying? It's, it's a Define. I mean, it's, if you've seen the previous versions of the Define R series, and for some reason it's not called the R series anymore, it's just the Define 7 series. They got rid of the R. But it's, very much like what we've seen before. It's not. It's a, It's an iterative update, and the the really big difference here is just that this is a Volt Tower version. If, if it weren't for the fact that I got the XL, I'd be looking more along like, okay, this is kind of more of the same, but they've done a few things. One of the things that they did was they added plastic channels for cables, and I've seen this from other case makers. I think NZXT might have been the first one to do this. So they've all they've had Velcro for a long time, but now it's Velcro along with plastic channels. So just little things like that. And it it's the the layout, the cable management is excellent. The location and size of the, the grommeted openings are very good. So I have, I have zero complaints so far. I've not done a big storage heavy build yet. I wanted I want to do that, convert the case, put a bunch of hard drives in there and see how that goes. I need to do thermal testing on it. Initial findings have been kind of par for the course. I saw Gamers Nexus did a, a very in-depth thermal testing of this one for their launch review. And it's not stellar, but I mean, this was a case made for silence first and foremost. So I never expected it to be as good as an airflow case. That's just not what it is. I will say though, in my build, I took off the top panel because like the Vector RS that I reviewed before this, this comes with more than one top panel. So you can slide off the like insulated panel and then they're inside the giant accessories box is an entirely new top panel, which is fully perforated, like a ventilated panel. So, uh, you know, flexible, big, lots of storage and cooling options. And it's, it's got that nice hinge door on the front that hides a couple of five and a quarter inch external base. So I, if the pricing of this one is is pretty high though, one seventy nine for the base model that does not have a side panel uh, window, then you move up to the tempered glass versions like the one that I got in for review of the XL. It's two hundred nine ninety nine, so you're up to about two hundred and ten bucks. So, it, but I'm, I'm thinking about it though. If you if you think about high end full tower case options, you can get pretty high. This is it. It becomes kind of a smaller subset of the case market because it's full tower. And then I think about stuff like Corsair Subsidian, and suddenly 209 doesn't sound that expensive. It's not anywhere near as stylish or as high end as the Obsidian stuff, but it's a define, which means high build quality. Just to give you an impression of the build quality, a lot of it has to do, and with this size, there was a little bit more flex than with previous define R series cases, but it's it's huge. So like if once I had it loaded, I could torque it just a little bit. But they tried to counter that with, it's a very thick construction. I did not actually get out some calipers and try to figure out a spot to measure the thickness of this rolled steel, but it weighs over 36 pounds empty. So it's, it's a very heavy case. 
And I think they did a good job. They did a very good job of updating the Define line. It's been over two years. I was surprised. I looked at my old Define R6 review. It was from January of 2018. So just over two years ago. And no complaints, really. If you like the Define series, you'll like this one, too. Well, and this is the... Because they've had, you know, like you said, it's been a while for the Define updates, but it's been even longer for the XL, right? It's been several generations since they did a dedicated XL model. I, I don't know the year, but yeah, that sounds right. Because they've, they've I, definitely had their full tower cases before. Yeah, and I was, because I like the fractal cases, uh, but I like EATX motherboards. And you can, some of their Define cases will fit, technically fit uh, an EATX, but it's not perfect because the board overruns the grommet area and uh you know it's, it's just it's a little cramped and so i was always looking for an excel version but it it's been as far as I've, I've seen it's been like years and years since they had updated that but yeah something to look look into but uh what, sorry, what was the price again it was uh this is 209, 209. for the tempered glass version i think the base model is 179 Okay. So you pay a little bit of a premium for the glass panel, but it's it's a well made enclosure. I, I don't think the price is that crazy. All right. Still, well, then, uh... I still like the last one I looked at better, though. The Fractal's uh, Vector RS. Not as big, but it had kind of that asymmetrical thing going on, which I'm a sucker for. And that was 179 Okay. Well, if you're interested and you're, you've been itching for a, a new fractal case, especially an XL model, come check out uh, Sebastian's uh, impressions and uh, photos of his build over at PCPer.com. It's the fractal. It's because it's, they're just fractal now, right? Not fractal design anymore. Their website's still fractal design, right? The I, the packaging says just fractal on it. The mm -hmm. case just says fractal on it. And so as far as I know, they've completely transitioned over to just being called fractal. All right. So the fractal. Define X, Define Seven XL. All right, well then let's uh, let's do our picks of the week. Uh, so I'll start off uh, first. I've got these uh, Sony. Uh, what is the model number again? It's the uh, MDR seventy five oh six. These are studio monitor headphones. They've been around for years. Um, you know, and, and since the nineties, I believe early nineties. And I, I I bought this particular pair about ten years ago. And they're great. They're great headphones, uh, but the the ear pad started to to wear over time, and you can see it kind of started to rip, and it's all smushed in, and uh, you know it, it it was getting getting gross and and not comfortable. So I uh, I looked and I found that there are replacement ear pads uh, for for headphones. Uh, I'm not a headphone geek or anything, so this was news to me. Uh, if, you know, people out there who follow this stuff are probably you know shaking their heads that I didn't know this, but uh, I went out and, and I bought this particular pair uh, or this particular set of ear pads. It's the uh, WC is the, the seller, the brand. And, uh, and they're great. And I'm, I'm wearing them uh, right now. They go on pretty easy. And I've noticed, I don't know how they compare to the old ones when they were brand new. Uh, Cause maybe the, you know, things have changed obviously as they've gotten squished down and, and kind of torn up, but these sound better. They're more comfortable. The, the sound is, uh, the isolation is better now. Uh, so for 20 bucks, I revitalized these 10 year old headphones. And, uh, and if you, so if you have these, obviously this is what I would recommend this, this particular uh, model will have a link to the show notes, but just, just in general, if you've got some headphones that are starting to wear, uh, I'm sure a lot of brands have, uh, you know, have, air, have replacement pads that you can pick up, uh, for your particular headset there. So. Jim, it sounds like you are not initiated into the world of headphone ear pads and how they change the sound. Because they can. I, they can dramatically change the sound. I guess, how, yeah. How far away they are, what they're constructed of, you know, the shape. Yeah. So all around, much better, much better. Uh, let's see. Jeremy, what have you got for us? This is sheer and utter insanity. If you still like Sub 4 Beyond the Sword... Caveman to Cosmos is an active mod that is still going. You start at 200,000 BC with the vague idea that throwing rocks at things occasionally turns it into food. 
and have to, you know, develop the ideas of, you know, maybe living in a cave is a step up from just camping beside a river or a tree. Uh, that cooperation with other humans in your tribe might benefit you in some ways. Uh, smacking a club on the ground on sharp rocks makes a better club. It took forever for me to get out of the Paleoithic era. Uh into which you then start in the prehistoric era. It goes on and on. Like the a game they're saying will probably run you about an hour uh, or a hundred hours. Uh, it is huge. There are dozens of civilizations uh, that you've never seen before. The way that fighting works is completely different. Taking over cities is a little bit more like Civ Three, where it's incredibly hard to do. You eventually go out into space. You're going to run into aliens and all sorts of fun things. Uh, for a while, you spend a lot of time with a hunter hunting animals because you bring the animals back to your city and all of a sudden can build things off of them. And then you invent a few more things and a few more technologies and holy crap, I need to go out and get more deer because now they can do this too or I can train wild hunting cats. It's nuts. Like, if you like Civ and you like the slow pace... Uh, type games like Civ. This, it's insane. I'm going to burn a lot of time on this. Is this what you were playing Last right time. before we uh, started the show? Because yeah. I saw it in Discord. It, it said, I couldn't see the whole line. It just said Civilization, and then it cut off. So, yeah. Nice. All right. Well, that's the Caveman to Cosmos mod for Civ 4. And uh, like I guess it was originally released in 2010. And based Last on. Last update the, was earlier uh, this February. Okay, yeah, so they're still working on it. That's great. We'll have a link uh, in the show notes to this. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't uh, I haven't played Civ 4 in a while. I got hard on Civ 5. That's, that's, that's the wrong way to say that. I got hard on Civ 5. I, I played a lot of Civ 5. Uh, but, yeah, I haven't played Civ 4 in a long time. So this might be worth uh, firing it back up. Okay, Josh. Uh, probably... My current favorite mouse, the G502, but it's on special. It's a special edition. Uh, what? It's only it's only thirty five bucks, but if you do the promo code, it's another seven and a half off. Uh, you know the the styling may not be for everyone, but it's got a great sensor. It's got a great feel. It's a larger size mouse for people with, you know, a little bit more ham hands, you know, uh, customizable in terms of weight, all of these wonderful things, programmable RGB, huge selling point. And, you know, once you, uh, once you add that promo code, it's, it's essentially half off of the, the bog standard G502. So it's, uh, it's a nice, uh, nice little mouse for the, uh, the price. If, if you're in the market for one. It has the tilt wheel. I didn't get the model with the tilt wheel. Hmm. Well then, now's your chance. All right. Uh, so we'll have a link to there in the show notes. Is this is this uh, any indication on the time for this limited offer, Josh? No idea. No idea. New okay, Egg doesn't well, ever tell us anything. Yeah. So uh, act fast uh, if you want to save about half off on the G502 SE Hero from Logitech. Uh, all right, Sebastian. Now his first pick was shoes. Yes. But he, he, as a coward, he threw that well, away. No, I cause... thought it was something better because the shoes were like, hey, you know, I can't think of anything. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago I bought these really comfortable uh, foam. I can't remember the name of them. Like New Balance has this foam series. They're not expensive and they're super, super light for running shoes. But forget about that. Uh, Industrial Light and Magic posted today on their YouTube channel the virtual production of The Mandalorian. Whether you're a fan of the show or not, I actually admit that I am not. I've never seen it. But I'm a sucker for behind-the-scenes special effects stuff I always have been. And the soundstage that they constructed for this is unlike anything I've ever seen. It's crazy. It's And it's it's relevant to, to what we do because it's they're using a PC gaming engine. They're actually using Unreal Engine <laughs> to create the backdrops. And then the soundstage is like a th almost 360 micro led displays so then they just have this unreal engine background displayed all around the actors and when they're shooting it a lot of the stuff you're seeing is in camera so it's not like they're doing everything in front of a green screen and then adding it all in after the fact the actors are able to see the environment the lighting 
uh, is coming from the screens around them. So it's, it's the correct colors and intensity and they obviously can play with it quite a bit. They were showing in the video things like, oh, I want this over here and just like moving it immediately and then having it render in real time with the changes to the rocks or whatever they wanted done. I was watching this and just thinking, if George Lucas had had this, would he have ever given up Star Wars? He could have been like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can just do everything in Unreal Engine in real time and film in front of these LED displays. I think he'd still be making Star Wars movies, but you know, it, the this kind of technology is amazing to me. And I think from an artistic standpoint, if you're it's somebody who's interested in, in filmmaking, I hope that this kind of catches on because the idea that actors and every actor I've seen an interview with who acts in front of a green screen for an entire special effects heavy movie, they don't like it. None of them like it. And this is, uh, there's a lot of physical props, things to interact with. And then they're actually able to look around and kind of see the exact environment they're in. But they're talking about just little stuff. Like if you're a filmmaker and you, you need to do a dawn shot or you need like this particular time of day and it's taking forever to get the right take. It's, it's whatever time of day you want it to be for as long as you want it to be. It's kind of insane to think about this. Like I want it to be uh, 7 30 PM and it'll just be that way forever. And it's actually in the room you're standing in with your camera. So Boy, do you know how much easier that makes the VFX guys, especially when it comes to reflections off of somebody's helmet? Uh Yeah. Yeah. We don't need no RTX on. No. Because, I mean, even the ceiling in this room are displays. So it's like, yeah, if there's a plane flying overhead and you want this cool shot of the the reflection in the helmet, well, it's all there in the room. Uh, That's that's pretty interesting. So, yeah, we'll have a link to this uh, over at the ILM uh, uh, video effects uh, YouTube channel. So that sounds uh, that's pretty interesting because I I really I enjoyed that series so far. The Mandalorian Uh, felt much nicer, much not nicer is the wrong word, but it felt much more Star Trek. Gosh, it's late and I'm cold. My heater doesn't work up here. It's 50 degrees. It's actually it's probably below 50. Join the club, buddy. (laughs) It's a uh, 14.2 C in the room that I'm in right now. I can't do math. Uh, I can't do conversions. Cool. I think it's about 55. 55. 53. Yeah. Anyway, His Star Wars. Born. Star Wars. I, I thought the Mandalorian felt a lot more like Star Wars than uh, mm. you know why? Than the movies. Because of the way they shot it. Because the way they shot it, Jim, we're learning behind the scenes because it wasn't green screen. Yeah. It was more organic. Also, they didn't let Ryan Johnson anywhere near this production. Hmm, that was very probably, probably helped. Yeah. But uh, all right, check uh, check that out. We have a link in the show notes. Uh, well, that's the show for this week. Anybody else? Anything they want to cover? Any, anything they want to mention? Uh, I will no. apologize. Uh, I was. I, I, I believe it was Toxinate uh, in our Discord. I think it was. So somebody called me out because I referred to the Team America as puppets, and it's it's marionettes. I, I think it, I said the puppet movie. I might okay. have said the puppet. No, I, I said puppets. Um, it's marionettes, or it's, and, and it's and art. You know what? It's I art. have to say for anybody who's correcting us, uh, that's. I mean, I'm not. I'm not going to say it. But I mean, there's a certain kind of person who would correct somebody when they said puppet meant marionette, and I think you know who you are. Um, I can't find the message now. It came up in our Discord a few minutes ago. But anyway, yeah, you uh, deleted it in shame. Well, I, my my point is, uh, I, I meant no disrespect to all of all of the art forms, and uh, I didn't know puppets was a bad word. But uh, well, that's it for for this show. We're all going back to to being John Malkovich. Do you know that? I never saw that movie. It was mm. he 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 wanted to explore puppetry and marionettes, yeah. and oh. of course, you've got a half door behind you, which was the entrance to. John Malkovich's brain. Ah, yeah. So I think that that it's it's a piece of cinema that's coming alive in our podcast. Excellent. Well, maybe terrifying. once I get this this new location set up a little better, we'll go in that door and see what's there. That's uh, but terrifying. Uh, yeah, yeah. So hopefully, uh, like I said, we're in a new location. Hopefully, my audio was better this week. Uh, it's still a little echoey in here because I haven't been able to get all the treatments up. I've got blankets draped over tripods. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm doing what I can, but uh, the plan eventually is to blanket the, well, blanket the room in uh, acoustic blanket. treatment. 
Oh, or blankets. Okay. Blankets with thumbtacks. It works. Yeah, just do the Big college curtains. thing and just like tack blankets up to the wall. Yeah. But, uh, well, we, we're glad you could join us this week. Uh, we hope everyone has a good one. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week, hopefully on Wednesday. We'll get, try to get back to those Wednesdays now that I finally got this new office set up. I was able to get everything up the stairs into the attic here. So uh, have, I hope everyone has a great week. We'll see you next time.